Make sure you're subscribed to The Word of the Lord Endures Forever. Type The Word of the Lord Endures Forever in your podcast provider. Hit that subscribe button and leave us a five-star review. This will make it easier for other podcast listeners to find The Word of the Lord Endures Forever. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is brought to you in part by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. LHF is a recognized service organization of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, dedicated to translating and publishing the books of our Lutheran faith into more than 100 languages for our Christian brothers and sisters around the world. Learn how you can take part in their work at lhfmissions.org. Welcome to The Word of the Lord Endures Forever with Pastor Will Whedon. But these men, rather than teaching purely what the Word of God said, corrupted the law in order to make it appealing or less threatening to the people. There is no greater betrayal of their sacred charge imaginable. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a daily verse-by-verse Bible study with the church, past and present. Pastor Whedon is leading us in a study of the book of Zephaniah. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Greetings, people loved by God. Last time, recall, we started out with the danger of schadenfreude, of taking delight in your enemy's troubles. Moab and the Ammonites, sister nations to Israel, descended from Lot, positively gloated at the downfall of Judah. They figured they'd soon be carving up her ancient territory as their very young. The God of Israel lets them know through Zephaniah that he's overheard their boastful plans and that that's just not how it's going to be. Rather, they will become a wasteland like unto Sodom and Gomorrah, overthrown in an instant and made a perpetual desolation. Rather than them plundering Judah, the remnant of Judah will actually return and plunder them and take over their territory. Judah will have a return to her land These nations are going to simply be wiped out by the Babylonians. Their fall is due to their pride. Pride goes before destruction, remember, and because they taunt it and boast it against God's people. The Lord, in fact, has plans to famish all the gods of the earth and to bring one nation after another into the worship of the true God. They will fall under the sword of the word of God, just as the Ethiopian eunuch was converted at the preaching of Philip. And... God will make the great city of Nineveh a waste as well, as Jonah had foretold, even though her destruction was delayed for a time by the people's repentance. She, too, is going to end up falling by her own pride. A reading from the holy prophet Zephaniah, the third chapter, beginning at verse 1. Woe to her who is rebellious and defiled, the oppressing city. She listens to no voice. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. Her officials within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves that leave nothing till the morning. Her prophets are fickle, treacherous men. Her priests profane what is holy. They do violence to the law. The Lord within her is righteous. He does no injustice. Every morning he shows forth his justice. Each dawn he does not fail but the unjust knows no shame. I have cut off nations. Their battlements are in ruins. I have laid waste their streets so that no one walks in them. Their cities have been made desolate without a man, without an inhabitant. I said, surely you will fear me. You will accept correction. Then your dwelling would not be cut off according to all that I have appointed against you. But, All the more they were eager to make all their deeds corrupt. Therefore wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day when I rise up to seize the prey. For my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out upon them my indignation, all my burning anger, for in the fire of my jealousy all the earth shall be consumed. Zephaniah chapter 3 verses 1 through 8. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, since you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, 
that by patience and comfort from your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you've given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Ready to work through this next section? Let's consider it together. Verse 1, Woe to her who is rebellious and defiled the oppressing city. The Lord is here turning his attention back to his own people and denouncing the sad spiritual state of his holy city, Jerusalem. He characterizes her as rebellious, tossing the word of God behind her back and ignoring his commandments to do her own thing. We heard before that this was chiefly manifest in her syncretistic worship, trying to add Yahweh to the pantheon of gods of the nations all around her. But since the breaking of that first commandment invariably overflows into disobedience against all the commandments, the city itself is denounced as defiled and oppressing. That is, she became defiled by blood, think of the atrocities they had seen under King Manasseh, and instead of guarding and protecting the rights of the poor, her leaders became their very oppressors. Rather than being the city set on the hill, the light and the darkness, which God had called his people to be, the city had succumbed to the same wickedness that reigned in the darkness all around her. Verse 2. She listens to no voice. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. God did not leave Israel with merely the gift of the law through his servant Moses. He continually sent her prophets, one after another, generation after generation, to confront her with her sin, to call her to repentance, to restore her birthright, her ancient faith. But these men were ignored, sidelined, canceled. She won't listen to their voice or accept their correction. Let me just give you one example from Jeremiah. In chapter 44, he confronts the people about their idolatry and baking special cakes and calling on the queen of heaven, Asherah. But when he confronts them, they flat out refuse to listen to him. They tell him they will worship Asherah and continue to bake the queen of heaven her cakes. The examples could be multiplied, especially in those waning years of the kingdom. Zephaniah's words here are an exact description. Israel refused to accept any correction from the course she had charted. She did not trust in Yahweh. She did not draw near to her God. That is, she neither listened to his word, nor did she seek him in heartfelt prayer. She just kept going her own way. And this was not merely an affliction of the common people. It reached the highest levels of government. I know, sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? Verse 3. Her officials within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves that leave nothing till the morning. By calling her officials roaring lions and her judges evening wolves, the point is that they're using the authority and power entrusted to them solely for their own self-aggrandizement. They could not possibly care less about the spiritual or temporal welfare of the people depending on them. They were out to line their own pockets. Very simply, it was each man for himself. That was their motto. But even worse than her civil leaders being utterly corrupted is this. Verse 4. Her prophets are fickle, treacherous men. Her priests profane what is holy. They do violence to the law. God had indeed raised up faithful prophets like Zephaniah, like Jeremiah, But there were also a host of other men who claimed to be prophets. Think of Hananiah and Shemaiah in Jeremiah 28 and 29. Both men were fickle and treacherous. They pronounced as the word of the Lord whatever they thought the people wanted to hear. The result was that they were quite popular. Poor Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, confronted their lies. But so many refused to listen because what he said wasn't nearly as pleasant in the short term as the false prophecies of those men. And it didn't stop with the prophets. There was also corruption in the priests, whose special task was to both offer sacrifices and to teach Israel the law of the Lord. Remember Malachi chapter 2, verse 7? For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. 
But these men, rather than teaching purely what the Word of God said, corrupted the law in order to make it appealing or less threatening to the people. There is no greater betrayal of their sacred charge imaginable. That's why in the words of the Great Reformation hymn, we pray, Lord, keep us steadfast in your word. Curb those who by deceit or sword would wrest the kingdom from your son and bring to naught all he has done. Verse 5, the Lord within her is righteous. He does no injustice. Every morning he shows forth his justice. Each dawn he does not fail, but the unjust knows no shame. He has not yet abandoned his people. That fateful moment Ezekiel would behold when the glory of the God of Israel would remove itself from the temple, hover over the Mount of Olives, and then dissipate. It had not yet arrived. So God's still there amidst all the corruption present. He's still righteous and does justice, and he is not being unfaithful to her, but she is being unfaithful to him in her priests, her prophets, her leaders, and her people. Like a brazen prostitute, the unjust knows no shame. Verse 6, I have cut off nations. Their battlements are in ruins. I have laid waste their streets so that no one walks in them. Their cities have been made desolate without a man, without an inhabitant. Verse 7, I said, surely you will fear me. You will accept correction. Then your dwelling would not be cut off according to all that I have appointed against you. But all the more, they were eager to make all their deeds corrupt. God points to the judgments he's consistently meted out across the centuries to those nations who dare to resist him, who lift their heads in pride and assert that they may do exactly as they please, ignoring the law that God had implanted in the hearts of all. He has brought upon them one and all destruction. A nation can no more successfully fight against the law of God than a man jumping out of an airplane can fight against the law of gravity. Both such a nation and such a man are destined to go splat. And surely, his people ought to have understood this. He thought, surely they will fear me, attend to my word, accept my correction. Surely they want to escape the destruction decreed against all pride. But no, their corruption continually increased. They did not, they would not repent. Verse 8, Therefore wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day when I rise up to seize the prey. For my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out upon them my indignation, all my burning anger, for in the fire of my jealousy all the earth shall be consumed. So, is this a prophecy of judgment and destruction? Is it a reference to the final last day, the day of wrath, when this earth will be consumed in the fire of the Lord's righteous indignation? Possibly. But with this verse, we're on the cusp of the change from law to gospel. And when you think of the decision to gather the nations and assemble the kingdoms, you can't but think of the mission of the Holy Church, no? And so might this be taken as a reference to the judgment which is poured out on Christ, on his cross, a judgment that then comes to all the world as salvation. Now, before you throw out the idea, silly, wait till we cover the next section. But that's going to have to wait till next time. That's when we'll hear about God at that time changing all people's speech, making it pure, making them call on his name and serve him with one accord and how he'll gather people from all over and they'll not be put to shame because of their rebellious deeds for God is going to remove the haughty from their midst and give them honest mouths and tongues and they will all lie down and graze in good pasture and no one will be able to make them afraid. Till next time, people loved by God, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thanks for listening to The Word of the Lord Endures Forever with Pastor Will Wheaton. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a listener-supported program. You can donate by check. Make your check payable to The Word Endures 
and send it to Box 616, Collinsville, Illinois, 62234. You can also make a secure online contribution at thewordendures.org. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a production of LPR, Lutheran Public Radio.